He's Jim Miller, the author of Those Guys Have All the Fun Inside the World of ESPN. And he gave us live from New York the complete uncensored history of Saturday Night Live. Also working on an ESPN movie, finishing up a book on the agency CAA, which will come out in May. And Jim joins us here in the Man Cave. How are you? Great. Yeah? Thanks for having me. Pull up to the microphone there a little bit. Uh, so where do you want to start? I, I was mentioning that um, if, uh, if we were going to look at the role that our show played at ESPN with Bill Simmons last day, last interview, what that meant, the collapse of Grantland, the website, what role did we play in that? Well, I guess it was the final tipping point. It was uh, Bill's appearance on your show. You could set your clock by how long it took afterwards to, for Skipper to hit the delete key afterwards. But were they waiting to fire Bill Simmons? I think that, you know, uh, there are a lot of people who subscribe to the Ohio in 1995 theory. You ever hear about that? It's like allegedly that in the state of Ohio in 1895, there were two cars and they collided. I mean, the whole state, there were only two cars and they collided. So I think that, like, from, uh, from the moment that Simmons said, you know, he called Goodell, Commissioner Goodell a liar, and I dare you to suspend me, and he got suspended that fall. I think things were on a certain track anyway, but certainly his appearance on your show speeded things up considerably. But you also look at this with, and it felt, felt like they were top heavy with salaries and, you know, they had all these cuts there. But when, when we look at the rights fees that ESPN, like, is this still a good model with what they've done? Or what's this going to be five years, 10 years down the road for a lot of these cable outlets with the money they're spending on rights fees? So the, I'll give you the good news first. The good news is that Skipper went on, I mean, he outdid George Steinbrenner in terms of spending money in sports, right? Yeah. He, he went on one of the great sports shopping sprees of all time. And what he did was he built a huge moat around ESPN. So when Fox went into business, he was like sitting back and he was a little worried about some talent, but in terms of rights, he had everything light up. And by the way, he didn't do like three or four deal, year deals. Like he did like eight, 10, yeah. 12 year deals, spent a ton of money. Did he overpay in some areas? Absolutely. At the end of the day, though, they wanted those properties. And it's really, really hard to compete with ESPN um, as a result. The bad news is that he, that he overpaid, you know, and he overpaid for some rights and he overpaid for some talent. And, you know, it's tough. They, fought, they laid off 300 people last month. And so there, there is a cost to pay sometimes. But when you have, the, what's the consumer going to get if people aren't watching ESPN on a regular basis? That it's all a la carte. Wait, what is that going to do to network or cable cable sports? Well, here's here's the big question, right? So let's just say everybody cuts the cord. Are you going to spend twenty five dollars or thirty dollars a month for ESPN? How many people are willing to do that? I don't know. That's what we're that's we're on the verge of finding out. Because as the, you know, they lost 6 million households, I guess it was, in the past 14 months, I think, something like that. What's that mean financially? You got $6.20 a household. So it's kind of serious money. And remember something else, that through the 90s and the early part of the new century, they were just, they were delivering to Burbank, to Disney, unbelievable numbers, right? Eisner had forced, you know, 20% compounded rate subscription rate every single year on those cable companies and they were delivering huge amounts of money that's how skipper could buy all that stuff so that's kind of abated and those growth numbers are no longer in existence so it's really hard the financial model right now is in flux with espn what's it going to mean so as a consumer though i i just go out of card if i, I you know people aren't watching sports center the way they once did but they'll still you know, i guess watch a game how are, how are we viewing here? I mean, what Skipper knows is, look, uh, American Idol, I mean, it used to be big, now it's not, right? Whatever. Three years from now, you're going to want to watch the Rose Bowl. I mean, that's the thing about sports. Yeah. That's the thing about live sports. We are going, you're going to want to watch those games. They spent over $25 billion on college football. Three, five years from now, you're going to still want to watch those games. So he's pretty comfortable with the knowledge. But you're not watching SportsCenter. Not right now, but you know, that's, first of all, dollars and cents wise, no offense, but that's like a grain of sand on a big beach. Okay. We're, we're talking about big properties, $15 billion on Monday Night Football. 
I mean, they spent a lot of money on those properties. How does NBC and, uh, and Fox, uh, you know, how do they fare in, in this? And in, in what model do you like better? Uh, you know, the thing about Fox when they got into business is you don't have to go toe to toe with ESPN. You don't have to spend all those rights. You know, it's kind of interesting because I think one of the things that uh, you're seeing from Jamie Horowitz at Fox Sports is that he's really concentrated on, on programming. So he's bringing over a lot of talent over there and it's not just about the games and about spending a lot of money on rights. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting way to look at it. He's Jim Miller. He wrote the book on ESPN also Saturday Night Live, joining us here in the Man Cave. If you had written the book, now you went out and interviewed, I don't know how many hundreds of people for both of these projects, but if you would, how different would those books have been if you just wrote the book with the interviews, but it wasn't just interview based? Oh my gosh, much easier. These books are a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, I was 6'4 and blonde before I started. It's like, it's ridiculous because... Well, what was worse, doing ESPN or Saturday Night Live? Uh, well, Saturday Night Live was, was a joy. And it's fun. it was fun. These people are much more free-flowing. They're comfortable talking about things good, bad, and ugly. ESPN, first of all, ESPN didn't cooperate for the first year. And people are really protective of their brands. And then people are really worried about what the bosses are going to say. Um, you know, the, the world that Lauren Michaels created at SNL is a much more free flowing one. But you were, uh, you were the barbarian at the gate with ESPN in that first year where now I wasn't told not to cooperate. Now, when, I, when you wrote that book, I'm at NBC. Um, and, uh, in fact, my boss said, you know, if you want to talk to him, go ahead. But I'm curious, was there an internal memo at the mothership saying not to, not to talk to you? Uh, in a word, yes. Yeah, I know. I wasn't allowed to, uh, to talk to any current employees. But, you know, they got over it to their credit. I mean, I really, really appreciated that. They changed but did they mind. vet you out to say, what, what's your angle on this? What are you going to tell yeah, but I mean, come on. <laughs> you didn't tell him. Everything. Well, no, of course not. You know, of course not. But I mean, look, Skipper just talked to me about Grantland a couple of weeks ago for Vanity Fair. Uh, you know, they're not bitter. And then Saturday Night Live. I we were curious, who has been banned from Saturday Night Live? Is there a list of people that are not allowed to be on Saturday Night Live? Uh, well, not allowed, but like they shouldn't wait by the phone to get invited back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first one actually was he's no longer with us, but was Milton Berle because he kind of violated all of Lauren's covenants right from the beginning, including staging the standing ovation. <laughs> Don't worry, I got the standing ovation covered. It's like, <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a no-no. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you go off script, anytime you go off script, like, you know, Wayans went off script and- Is it Damon Frank Wayans? Zapper, yeah, Frank Zappa went off script. Uh, certainly Sinead O'Connor went off script. I mean, that's, that'll get you voted off the island real fast. Um, even though it's a live show, surprises are not good uh, on that show. But we talked about, I mean, Sinead O'Connor, look what it did for the show. Like, wasn't it a positive that she went off script? It got uh, coverage. It got coverage, but the show doesn't necessarily need that kind of coverage. Is it still relevant? The show? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, you know, they just announced uh, December 19th is the Christmas show. Tina Fey and Amy Poehler are hosting, co-hosting, and Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band are, you know, the musical guests. That's pretty darn good. Adele is going to be on this weekend. I mean, you know, it's still part of the political process. You got Trump on. Yeah. And Hillary came on the first week. I, I think they, I think they, after 41 years, I think they've done a pretty good job. And the thing that you always hear is it's not as funny as it used to be. But I swear to God, people are saying that in the second year. Like, so it's just one of those hardy perennials that we're always associated with. Saturday Night Live. But we do consume it differently. I go back to that word where you'll see something on the, the internet and you'll see uh, you know, almost a digital short. Like, you know, let me see that clip there. And a lot of people are, that's how they're viewing nowadays. Right, but they're also doing that with Jimmy Fallon. They're yes, not like with Johnny, Johnny Carson, I mean, or you know, even the early days of Jay. You sat down, you watched it, or you taped it and you watched it. Now you can, on your Twitter feed, you can get whatever individualized segment you want from it. So the whole... And that's happening with evening news, too. So I think the whole landscape is changing towards that. And you're doing a, a book on uh, CAA, the agency CAA? Yeah. Why? Because uh, 
I mean, look, SNL was a show, ESPN's a network, CA is like everywhere. I mean, people don't know those initials as well as they do SNL or ESPN, but Madonna, George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Derek Jeter, JJ Watt. I mean, you just like, it's all over the place. Coca-Cola, Chipotle. Uh, it, 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 this is, this has been an amazing journey through the uh, the world of CA. They they touch so much, and particularly when it comes to content, they're like involved in every single thing that's happening at the cross section of content and technology now. But is it cutthroat? Is there controversy, backstabbing? Well, we'll try. <laughs> <laughs> You're hoping for that. <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's just been it's amazing. Uh, it's just an amazing company. Well, the whole agency thing is always. You know, I and, you know poaching people from other agents and how they deal with networks and uh, you know do me a favor on this guy and I'll get you this guy for a cheaper price. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. It's pretty creepy, right? Well, but think about the other day I was writing about David Letterman coming to CBS and that was CA. You know that was CA made that happen. Michael Ovitz. I mean that that was an extraordinary, an extraordinary piece of business. The uh, movie, the SP and the movie. No, I haven't seen anything written about this it's plain right oh no, it is no i'm just kidding it's not, oh i missed it um uh what's the update on i finished the script and now i'm just waiting for the powers that be to weigh in can you give me a nugget of what role i play in this script uh well it's voluminous of course it should be um I think the sex scenes, it's going to be challenging to kind of direct them the way that I wrote them. But we'll Just as long as they're done, I didn't, you know, artfully. I mean, that's all I care about. Well, we're going to stick close to the truth. So oh, I think will? artful is, you know, right, the well, operative word. I hope Keith's okay with that. Yeah, well, hide all women and children. Uh, okay, so what, what angle do you take? Can you, can you tell me? What no. Angle? You cannot? No. Will I be surprised at the angle you take? Oh, I hope. I hope, but by the way, like I'm not Aaron Sorkin. So, I mean, Aaron Sorkin has that kind of power over a script, yeah. right? So I just, you know, worked on what they want it to work and they'll see if they like it and they could change the angle anytime they want. Did they, did they uh, can you give me the years? Yeah, uh, no. You cannot, okay. <laughs> could it be in the mid nineties? Uh, it could be. It could be. One down, nine to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So mid nineties. No, it could. I look. I, I have no idea who's what it's playing. Going to wind who's up. playing me? Because you always. Yeah, we went through this but before. Dude, but you but know. now it's serious, though, Jim. Mm -hmm. Now we need to. I know Ryan Gosling said if he can go to the gym for like eight months straight right, and really enough. get buff, he could possibly aspire to. And now I'm curating uh, that kind of space. I, I'm. You're a journalist, so I'm. I'm trusting you're telling me the truth right now. Well, actually, Ryan didn't say he that. He did not say that. No. Okay. All right. He was a little intimidated. He didn't want to even go down that path. All right, so you finish the script. You won't tell me what role I play, what year it, it's set in, but what's the time frame? Like I, Christmas uh, 2018 or something? I have no idea. It's not like a book. It's the opposite. <laughs> like the book. What, see, uh, there's some, uh, what's the problem? Questions over here. About what? Well, your role, you discuss what, what about the Danettes? Are we... Well, you didn't work at ESPN. Fritzy did. Well, what about, you know, at the end of the movie when they wrap up where everyone landed and they show a scene of you messing around at the man cave? Oh, there's a thought. You know, like at the end of Boogie Nights when everything comes Wait, down. But when Reynolds he says there's a thought, he's already written the script. So he didn't have the thought when he wrote it. Well, everything is oh. rewritten. Rewrite. Okay. Yeah, you know, right. That's where the real money is, by the way. Jim, I have some notes for you after the show, by the way. Okay, great. Oh, God. Great. I got Fritzy's diary from Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I, got, those, I got some notebooks. I got some. Uh, those, some those were really helpful. Let's just put it that way. He's Jim Miller, the author of Those Guys Have All the Fun Inside the World of ESPN and Live from New York, the complete uncensored history of Saturday Night Live and also the ESPN movie and uh, a new book. When, when's the book on uh, CAA out? May 10th. May 10th. You're a busy man. Uh, thank you for stopping by as always, Jim. Thanks for having me.